Good evening, everyone. Thank you all uh, for coming. It's, uh, it's amazing to me uh, to see uh, so many people on a weekday evening uh, giving up their time to discuss uh, what I think uh, is really uh, one of uh, the great social problems confronting American society today. I also uh, have to uh, offer my uh, thanks to Ari Cohn and the post-prison education program who have done so much uh, to organise this visit for me today and uh, uh, I really appreciate the magnificent work that they've done. And uh, I've, I've learned in the short time that I've been here a, a tremendous amount uh, about uh, uh, the extraordinary work uh, that's going on uh, in Washington. Uh, I thought what I would do today uh, or this evening is talk a bit about uh, the research I've been working on over the last 15 years that tries to understand the scope, the causes, the consequences of the growth uh, in incarceration uh, in the United States. And this is a trend that dates from the 1970s, uh, uh, as we'll see. And, uh, and I think it's telling us something fundamentally important uh, about uh, American society. And the idea that I want to talk about specifically uh, is uh, an idea not co coined by myself, as we'll see, but uh, a sociologist, David Garland. And this idea is uh, mass incarceration. Mass incarceration. And uh, it's this idea, I think, uh, of mass incarceration uh, that should challenge us to think about what should be the role of criminal punishment uh, in our society, uh, what uh, uh, notions uh, of fairness and equality and citizenship and democracy uh, should we aspire to. So let me begin, mass incarceration. When I think of the penal system uh, in the United States, uh, this is the image uh, that often comes to mind for me. Uh, so this is a correctional facility in California, uh, at Chino, uh, and this is a uh, gymnasium uh, that has been converted to a housing unit uh, because of uh, uh, conditions of overcrowding uh, in the Californian penal system. And uh, we can see that the, the people in this photograph are uh, are largely men, uh, largely uh, young men, young men uh, of colour, uh, and they've been uh, crammed into this uh, room that uh, was originally designed uh, for a completely different purpose, uh, but this is where they're serving their confinement. I want to contrast this image with this one. And this, of course, I'm not sure if people will uh, recognise this immediately. This, of course, is uh, a photograph from the so-called uh, Beer Summit. And uh, the Beer Summit was occasioned uh, by uh, the arrest uh, by Sergeant Crowley, who uh, is the gentleman uh, seated uh, just next to the president, who's got his uh, head to the camera. Uh, and uh, Sergeant Crowley uh, arrested uh, a Harvard professor, uh, uh, Skip Gates, uh, who's the, uh, the head of the uh, African American Studies program uh, at Harvard. Uh, and uh, Skip had returned uh, from a, uh, an overseas trip and uh, he was trying to get into his house in Cambridge and uh, uh, he wasn't able to uh, get in through the door. The door had jammed, and so he, uh, he, he pushed his way in. Uh, a neighbour had seen uh, uh, Skip enter his uh, house in this fashion and called the police, and uh, uh, Officer Sergeant Crowley showed up uh, and arrested him, and uh, Skip protested, but this is my house, and... Uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, you, you can't arrest me, uh, you, you can't arrest me here. Um, it became a, a national news story uh, and uh, the president promised us that he would use this 
the arrest of Skip Gates in his home, uh, he would use this as a teachable moment uh, about race and criminal justice uh, in the United States. And I don't think we really got that moment. Uh, I think we got this photo opportunity and instead of getting instead of getting this image uh, we got this one and so uh, part of what I want to do this evening is recalibrate the discussion a little bit and move uh, away from this particular photo opportunity uh, to try and document uh, the real facts about uh, uh, what the American criminal justice system uh, has become. Okay, mass imprisonment. So, uh, NYU sociologist David Garland uh, coins this term mass imprisonment. What is it? It's two things. Mass imprisonment is two things. Garland says, mass imprisonment is a rate of imprisonment that's markedly above the historical and comparative norm for societies of this type. And he's talking about uh, affluent liberal democracies. So th that sounds straightforward, right? We could identify societies that have a comparatively high level of incarceration, a historically high level of incarceration. But then he goes on to say, it's also something else. Imprisonment under the conditions of mass imprisonment Imprisonment ceases to be the incarceration of individual offenders and becomes the systematic imprisonment of whole groups of the population. So for me as a sociologist, this was simultaneously intriguing and slippery, right? I liked the idea that there was some collective significance for the scale of incarceration. But it was slippery because at what level are we no longer incarcerating the individual but incarcerating the group? And this was sort of the puzzle I was trying to resolve in my work. I was trying to figure out at what point are we no longer locking up individuals but we are in some sense, which is what we have to figure out, we are in some sense incarcerating the group. Okay, here's some empirical context. We measure the size of a penal system with an incarceration rate. And this is just the proportion of people in the population on an average day who are behind bars. And if we look at the Western European countries, so uh, on the slide here, we've got the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Italy, Austria, and so on. If we look at the Western European countries, the incarceration rate in all these countries is about 100 uh, per 100,000, 50 to 100 per 100,000. Uh, and we can compare these countries, so that's about 0.1 of 1% of the population uh, are behind bars. And we can compare incarceration in Western Europe to the US. And so the American incarceration rate is an order of magnitude larger than uh, Western Europe. It's extremely unusual compared to Western Europe. And I think we often lose sight of just how unusual uh, the US is uh, in this respect. Now, we've also got very good historical data, and we can look at the size of the prison uh, system uh, back uh, uh, to the 1920s. So let me show you now some historical data. And if we look at Prison incarceration rates, the number of uh, the proportion of the population in prison. If we go back to 1925 and move forward 50 years, 1925 to the early 70s, uh, the incarceration rate in the United States was about what it currently is in Europe, about 100 per 100,000. But then in the early 1970s, the system began to change, and it began to change continuously uh, for the next 30, 40 years. We're still living through it. And so that's what happened to imprisonment rates in the, uh, the United States over the last, uh, the last 35 years. We're at the tail end of uh, a three decades long 
period uh, of continuous growth. What do these numbers mean? We've got about now 1.5 million people in prison. These are people uh, serving uh, at least 12 uh, months, about 28 months at the median for a, a felony conviction. We've got another 780,000 people in county jails, and these are people serving uh, shorter sentences, less than 12 months, uh, or awaiting trial, typically. We've got another 800,000 people who are under supervision in the community, uh, on parole, who have served custodial sentences, uh, and now they've uh, gone back into the community and are reporting to a parole officer. And then on top of that, we have another 4.2 million people on probation. Uh, and by and large, these are people uh, who are under community supervision, uh, under the community supervision of a probation officer uh, who are uh, serving uh, suspended sentences. And so altogether now, we have about seven, over seven million people in the United States that are under some sort of criminal justice supervision this scale uh, of supervision is historically entirely new, right? So the period that we're at right now is entirely new and, uh, and it's really been with us uh, for about a decade now. Now, as striking as these figures are, uh, this is not uh, what's most important uh, about the criminal justice system in, the, uh, in America today. Uh, the most important thing about the criminal justice system in America today uh, is its unequal distribution across the population. So let's have a look at that uh, empirically and uh, see the extent of that inequality. So we're going to look at two, two years here. 1980, which was fairly early in the period of this uh, uh, process of prison growth, and uh, 2008. Uh, and uh, the two bars on the figure there show uh, the figures I've just been showing you. Incarceration rate, prison and jail incarceration rate uh, in the United States by 2008 was about 750 per 100,000, just under 1% of the population were locked up on an average day in 2008. It's about the same now, a little bit higher. But what if we just looked at men? And what if we just looked at men who were under age 35? And what if we just looked at men under age 35 with less than 12 years of schooling, men who had dropped out of high school? We see then, if we focus on that group, here we're looking at white men, uh, under 35 uh, years old, dropped out of high school, their incarceration rate is not 750 per 100,000, it's uh, 11,000 per 100,000, so uh, 11,950. So nearly 12% of all white male high school dropouts under 35 on an average day are under lock and key, either in a uh, county jail or state or federal prison. Now, of course, the most uh, profound uh, disparity in the criminal justice system uh, is the racial disparity. So let's see uh, some figures for African Americans. What's this telling us? This is telling us that uh, among African American men who are under age 35, if they dropped out of high school, by 2008, the chances that they'll be in prison is about 37%. 37% of all black male high school dropouts under 35 uh, are locked up right now. Uh, and uh, when we were first doing the work that estimated these numbers, uh, we were sure they had to be wrong. And uh, we checked and rechecked and rechecked, and this was now, uh, 10 years ago when we first started uh, doing this work. And, uh, uh, and I, I still find this uh, just uh, an extraordinary number. And I think one that's not widely known in our public conversation uh, about the scale of criminal punishment in America. 
Now, everything I've shown you so far is a snapshot, right? It's just a, a, a snapshot at a point in time. How many people are locked up uh, on a given day? Another way to think about this is to ask, well, what's the likelihood that someone's ever going to serve time in prison at some point in their lives? And we might be interested in that kind of a statistic because we think that serving time in prison confers an enduring disadvantage that affects a whole array of life chances even after someone's been released, right? And so we're interested in what's the size of the group who are at risk of, uh, of these uh, adverse outcomes that uh, can flow from uh, imprisonment. So then we, uh, then we did a, a different kind of project in which we were comparing two birth cohorts. Uh, first, we were looking at a group of people born just after World War II, so born in the late 1940s. And if you're born in uh, the late 1940s, you're reaching your, uh, your mid-30s uh, in the late 1970s. Uh, so let's have a look at some uh, figures on that post-World uh, post War II birth cohort. So these are, uh, these are men born uh, in the late 1940s. They're reaching uh, their mid-30s uh, by 1979. Uh, for non-college African Americans, uh, this is men who have never been to college. They may have completed high school. They may have dropped out. About one in eight if they were in this birth cohort born just after World War II, about one in eight, 12%, are going to go to prison, uh, have been to prison at some point uh, in their lives. If they dropped out of high school, we estimate that uh, the number's about 15% will go to prison at some point in their lives. Let's compare these men to a group of people uh, that were born in the late 1970s, and they're reaching uh, their mid-30s uh, right now. Okay, and so they're growing up through uh, the prison boom. For non-college African-American men, and that's about half of all African-American men, for non-college uh, African-American men, uh, about a third are going to serve time in state or federal prison. That's 28 months of incarceration uh, at the median uh, for a, a felony conviction. Uh, about a third. Uh, are going to uh, go to prison at some point in their lives. If they dropped out of high school, if they dropped out of high school, uh, nearly 70% uh, are going to go to prison uh, at some point in their lives. So for, for that group of uh, very low education uh, young men, uh, prison time has become entirely normal, right? It's become uh, a normal part of the passageway through adulthood. And this is new. We need only go back uh, 30 years to this post-war uh, birth cohort born just after World War II uh, to find a time when the penal system was not a ubiquitous presence in the lives of African-American men with low levels, uh, low levels of schooling. OK. Uh, in the sociology of the life course, uh, we think about all of the different events that mark the pathway uh, through adulthood. And the idea is, in, in the sociology of the life course, is that if you can hit these different events and in sequence, that's associated with a, a whole variety of uh, positive outcomes in later life. What are these life events uh, that we normally think about? Well, uh, completing schooling, uh, serving in the military uh, has been something people have uh, focused on, getting married. Um, in this context of extremely high incarceration rates, we have to also think, I think, about the prison as a life event that marks the passageway through adulthood, at least for uh, recent birth cohorts of African-American men. I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, some figures on this very, very quickly. Uh, here we're looking at uh, how many people by their mid-30s, black and white men, how many, how many of black and white men uh, by their mid-30s have been married? have completed uh, a four-year degree, completed a bachelor's degree, uh, have served in the military. If we compare imprisonment to these different life events, uh, we can see that serving time in prison uh, for African-American men is about three times as common as military service. 
it's much more common uh, than completing uh, a bachelor's degree. So African-American men now are more likely to uh, have been to prison to than uh, have completed uh, a four-year degree. The other thing to note from a, a table like this is the disparity. If we just look at the ratio, 27% to 5%. 27% for blacks to, compared to 5% uh, for whites in the likelihood uh, of imprisonment. This is a much larger disparity uh, than uh, just about all other uh, social indicators. So much larger than the racial disparity in marriage rates, educational attainment, uh, military service. We could multiply the examples actually and look at wages, employment, uh, uh, wealth, child mortality. Nothing distinguishes the experience uh, of blacks and whites in American society like contact with the criminal justice system. And this is a, a, a very large uh, disparity that overshadows most other social indicators. All right, so that's half my talk. That's half the story. And, uh, and the question now, I think, is, well, so what, right? Well, what is the significance uh, of these statistics? And I want to argue uh, this evening that this has really profound implications for how we think about uh, racial and class inequalities in American uh, society today. And I, I want to argue to you that the inequalities that are produced by this very high rate of incarceration are very profound and very enduring. And they're very enduring for three reasons. The inequality created by these very high rates of incarceration are invisible, they're cumulative, and they're intergenerational. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those three ideas now. The inequality created by incarceration are um, invisible, cumulative, and intergenerational. Invisible inequality, what does that mean? The inequalities created by incarceration are really hard to observe. And it's hard to think about the penal system as a source of uh, social or economic inequality. And why is that so? Because incarceration is so concentrated in a very small segment of the population, the penal system does not form any part of, uh, at all of the reality of the mainstream of American society. It's not something uh, many of us ever have to worry about or think about. The institutions themselves are segregative, right? Obviously, they pull people out of society and put them uh, in a, a custodial facility, often in far-flung places, away from the urban centres in which people uh, predominantly live. So this is a population very much uh, hidden from the view uh, of the mainstream uh, of society. For sociology, uh, this is very important because it means that incarceration is often overlooked in social accounting, the way in which we count the economic status of the population. And as a result of this, the level of inequality we observe is, tends to be underestimated, right? Because there's this large hidden population with very low uh, socioeconomic status, uh, we tend simply not to see it. So let me give you a very simple empirical illustration of this idea. Okay, employment rates. This is how we measure employment uh, in uh, the population. We're looking at African-American men who have dropped out of high school. These are men under age 35. Uh, this is a statistic called the employment to population ratio the employment to population ratio, what's the fraction of the population that have a job? And uh, uh, the census uh, regularly calculates uh, statistics like this to measure employment. And uh, they use, uh, for the measurement of these employment rates, uh, a household survey called the Current Population Survey, and it's used to measure the monthly unemployment rate. Uh, the big problem, of course, uh, with the current population survey, this household survey, is that it only surveys households. And what if you don't live in a household? What if you live uh, in an institutional setting? 
then you're not counted in the population and you, you don't form part of the uh, census assessment of the economic well-being of the population. So our big innovation here was simply to count prison and jail inmates as part of the population. Okay, we're trying to estimate the employment to population ratio, we should count the entire population. So what is the trend in employment, which doesn't look great anyway, if we only focus on the non-institutional population, what does the trend in employment look like if we also count the institutional population? This is what the true trend in employment for low-skill African-American men looks like. We can see that there's been a very substantial decline, right? A very substantial decline in employment. The entire gap between these two series is, is due to uh, the scale of the prison and jail population. That's what the gap is due to. Um, we can see that uh, through the 1990s, which was a period in which the labour market became very tight and it was thought that the economy was growing so fast uh, that it was providing jobs uh, for uh, very marginal workers that had been very difficult to reach uh, with social policy. And uh, if we look at uh, black men uh, who have dropped out of high school under 35, we can see that uh, through the 1990s, uh, their employment rates uh, fell, uh, in fact. And uh, the decline in employment uh, was driven by the growth in incarceration rates. Any appearance of the improvement in the employment situation of low-skill African-American men through the 90s is entirely an artefact of the growth of the penal system. Okay, so that's invisible inequality. Cumulative inequality. What do we mean by cumulative inequality? The inequality created by incarceration diminishes the economic status of those whose employment and wage rates are already extremely low. The people uh, in prison and jail uh, have extremely poor uh, employment opportunities, uh, have uh, extremely poor employment uh, records prior to, uh, prior to incarceration. As bad as their economic opportunities were before they entered prison, uh, we find that uh, prison makes things worse. If we look at wage rates and employment rates, after prison, uh, they're lower uh, than before. Um, how much lower? Uh, survey estimates uh, say that uh, imprisonment uh, reduces earnings uh, by about 40%. So uh, if, you were, uh, if you were making uh, $20,000 uh, before, uh, before you went to prison, uh, then you're making about uh, $12,000 uh, after you come out. Uh, we, we conducted uh, an experiment uh, in New York City where we sent job seekers uh, to uh, apply for entry-level jobs uh, throughout the five boroughs. Uh, uh, we sent people out to apply for jobs over a period of uh, a year. They applied for about 1,500 jobs. And these were trained testers, and they randomly presented evidence uh, to employers of uh, a criminal record, and we would send them out in pairs. And so one tester had a clean resume with no evidence of a criminal record. The other tester uh, had uh, on their resume uh, evidence of a criminal record. They listed uh, a parole officer uh, as a reference, which happens in uh, real life. And uh, they, uh, uh, they also listed some employment history in a correctional uh, facility. We made our testers dress alike, speak alike, answer job interview questions similarly. The only difference between them is that one would check the box saying, yes, I, uh, I have a prior criminal conviction. Um, uh, we found that uh, uh, reporting to an employer that you had a criminal conviction uh, reduced your chances uh, of a positive response by uh, the employer from about, uh, by about uh, a, th a third to a half. Okay, so this was a, a very significant uh, economic penalty uh, in, in the job market. We also found that the economic penalty of a criminal conviction in our experiment was larger for African-American job seekers uh, than for white job seekers. 
here's some descriptive data uh, to give you a, a, a sense of the earnings mobility uh, of people. Earnings mobility is unbelievably uh, important. Uh, what is earnings mobility? Earnings mobility is the way in which earnings tends to grow with age. And two-thirds of your lifetime earnings growth, two-thirds of the total growth in your earnings over your lifetime happens by about age 40. And it's a very, very regular pattern. Earnings are very stratified by age. As you get older, your earnings, uh, your earnings go up as you acquire experience, uh, as you acquire experience uh, in your job. It's unbelievably socially important because earnings growth allows men uh, to age into a whole variety of pro-social roles as a, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a breadwinner, as a provider uh, for a, uh, a family, uh, uh, as an attractive partner uh, in the marriage market. Earnings growth is a, a, a fundamental mechanism uh, by which uh, uh, men become uh, integrated into, uh, uh, integrated into uh, the rest of civilised society. Um, for people who are incarcerated, there is very little earnings growth. So here we're showing uh, earnings mobility over a 20-year period uh, for people who've never been incarcerated. If they score low on a cognitive test, if they've dropped out of high school, uh, for, uh, for low-income men, what this slide is showing, for no, low-income men, there's very little upward mobility uh, out of uh, the low-income group, okay? Earnings do not grow uh, on average uh, for those that, have been, uh, those that have been incarcerated, and this creates enormous obstacles uh, in playing a, a positive role uh, in uh, their families and communities. Okay, last bit, intergenerational inequality. Large prison populations means large numbers of children with parents in prison. There's a very active area of research now where uh, there's a lot of work being done trying to understand the effects of the incarceration of parents on kids. In our labour market studies, we often think of the economic penalty of incarceration as being uh, associated with the stigma the stigma of a, a, a criminal record, uh, we're increasingly finding that the stigma uh, of a criminal record uh, can also uh, af affect families and children, and the children of incarcerated parents uh, also bear, uh, bear some stigma. And there's new research now uh, providing evidence uh, of diminished school achievement, uh, behavioural problems, depressive symptoms uh, among the children. Uh, of uh, incarcerated parents. Interestingly, uh, there are uh, suggestions in this research that these effects are particularly large uh, for boys, for boys rather than girls. Um, let me uh, provide a very simple empirical illustration of this uh, intergenerational inequality. So here's another one of my, my time series. And here we're just counting the number of kids with a parent in prison or jail. And if we look at uh, Latino kids, uh, by uh, 2008, about 600,000 uh, Latino kids had a parent in prison or jail. If we look at uh, white kids, uh, about 700,000 by 2008 had a parent in prison or jail. And if we look at African-American kids, over a million uh, over a, mer uh, a million African-American kids now have a parent uh, who is uh, incarcerated. So this is about 11% of all black kids uh, have an incarcerated parent. If we take a birth cohort of kids born in uh, 1990, about a quarter of those kids will see uh, their father uh, sent to prison by the time they reach their 14th birthday. Okay, so the experience of uh, Incarceration is obviously per pervasive for uh, recent birth cohorts of uh, African-American men with low levels of education. It's also pervasive for the children uh, of those men. Okay, let's uh, go back to our 
original idea of mass incarceration. What is the significance of all of this for mass incarceration? You'll remember mass incarceration was two things, a rate of incarceration uh, that was markedly above the historical and comparative norm for liberal democratic societies. We've seen evidence of that where uh, in a historically novel point in the history of this country in which uh, we've got these uh, extraordinary incarceration rates uh, higher than anywhere else on the planet. Um, but there was this other part, right, where uh, David Garland was saying mass incarceration uh, involves not just the imprisonment of the individual but the imprisonment of the group. And we're trying to figure out, well, what does that mean? What does the imprisonment of the group mean? And uh, so this is my reformulation. When incarceration rates are so very high and so concentrated in a very small segment uh, of the population, and incarceration has large and enduring effects on social and economic inequality. Why are the effects large and enduring? Because they're invisible, cumulative, and intergenerational, right? So when incarceration has large and enduring uh, effects on inequality, what is mass incarceration? It's the production of a new social group in American society. It's a production of a social group that is basically cut off from the mainstream opportunities uh, that the rest, of, uh, the, the rest of the society enjoys. It's a contraction of citizenship, if you like. It's a contraction of full membership, uh, full membership in society. And I think that's the sense in which we can think about the incarceration of the group rather than the individual. So, where do we go from here? I think we're living right now for the first time in decades and decades uh, in a reform moment. The states are broke. The states are broke and they're looking to cut correctional budgets. They're looking to cut all budgets actually. Uh, but they, they want to cut correctional spending. It's crowding out uh, spending on other things uh, that voters care about, higher education, Medicaid. Uh, so for the first time, in a very long time, there's political will uh, for retrenching mass incarceration, for political will for reversing this tremendous expansion uh, in the American penal system. But I think we've got to ask ourselves, what's the problem that we really want to solve here? What is the problem? Is the problem very high rates of incarceration? Is that the problem we're trying to solve? I think the answer is no. Ultimately, that's not the problem we're trying to solve. Ultimately, the problem that we're trying to solve is the social costs of very high rates of unemployment, chronic joblessness, untreated addiction, untreated mental health problems, uh, housing insecurity, economic insecurity that have come to be concentrated among whom a group in the American population for which there is no social safety net. And this is young men with very low levels of schooling, right? And the penal system grew in response uh, to these social problems. And the implication, I think, is if we think about reform, if we think about retreating from mass incarceration only in criminal justice terms. And I think that's where the debate is right now, actually. It's largely a, a discussion uh, within uh, criminal justice policy experts. If we think about reform only in criminal justice terms, the reforms by themselves are gonna be insufficient because they're not going to address these problems uh, of unemployment, uh, untreated addiction, untreated mental health problems, housing insecurity, economic insecurity, uh, more generally. So that's the challenge, I think, is to have a much broader discussion about what this reform moment uh, should be about. So let me conclude with a plan. This is my proposal. This is, I think, a first step. This would be a first step uh, that tries to meet this challenge uh, of uh, this broader discussion. Uh, and this comes from uh, a, a Brookings Institution uh, paper uh, I wrote a, a year or so ago.
Okay, what about this? Let's give a transitional job to everyone coming out of prison uh, who needs a job. Now, not everyone coming out of prison needs a job because they already have uh, employment lined up. But uh, employment problems are uh, substantial, to say the least, uh, among people uh, coming out of prison. And uh, I reckon we would need 200,000 jobs. Uh, that's, uh, that's the uh, employment shortfall uh, uh, for people coming out of prison. So let's give them all a job uh, for a year. What are the other big deficits that we need to address? There's a massive treatment gap uh, right now. There needs to be uh, a, a larger commitment uh, to substance abuse treatment uh, after release, uh, after release uh, from prison. Uh, tremendous housing insecurity and uh, through supportive housing, uh, the problems of uh, the substance abuse treatment gap and housing insecurity can, uh, can be met together. As we've seen in the statistics too, this is an incredibly uh, unskilled population. The average level of schooling of people in state prison is about 10 years. 10 years of schooling on average. On average, state prisoners are high school dropouts. And so there's a, a, a massive uh, education gap uh, that needs to be filled. And I think we actually have good models of, uh, uh, of what a good system of correctional education would look like. And the Federal Bureau of Prisons mandates, uh, mandates educational programming uh, for everyone uh, with uh, less than uh, a high school diploma. Uh, and I think that's a, a model that should be uh, adopted by uh, the states. There is one criminal justice reform that's really important. I think there's a lot of evaluation evidence showing this now. Some states are having a great deal of success significantly curtailing re-imprisonment for technical parole violators. For a lot of states, the big growth in state prison populations was due to the revocation uh, of parolees. And limiting uh, uh, re-imprisonment, in particular for technical violators, can really curb uh, the growth of uh, prison populations. And there's a lot of evidence uh, showing now that this can be done uh, uh, very, very safely if the right uh, alternative uh, set of sanctions and supports uh, uh, are in place. The whole philosophy of a plan uh, like this is that supervision shifts from the prison to the community. And the supervision that's being provided is no longer criminal justice supervision, uh, but it's an intensive type of social support that's geared to employment, housing, uh, and good health. And the whole objective here is to try and build uh, a structure in which people have uh, a great deal of stability and predictability uh, in their lives. And that's the, that's the underlying philosophy. Is this a pie in the sky? Uh, is this a pie in the sky uh, liberal fantasy? That was a question I actually received in one talk. Is this a pie in the sky liberal fantasy? Um, well, I, ca I can say this. There are elements of, uh, there are elements of uh, this plan operating with enormous success uh, throughout the country. Each component uh, of this plan uh, has been uh, evaluated very positively uh, in some program uh, operating in a state or locality uh, around the country. So this is trying to synthesize uh, what I see as, re uh, as really the best practice. Um, how much does it cost? It costs eight and a half billion dollars. And uh, is that a lot of money? Everything's a lot of money at the moment, right? The, uh, the Congress uh, will not spend, uh, this Congress anyway, will not spend uh, an extra cent right now. 
Uh, when, <laughs> when I first wrote this, uh, when I was first sort of putting this together, this was just after the uh, TARP bailout and uh, uh, the stimulus package, and so uh, Congress had just signed off on about $1.5 trillion worth of uh, uh, support uh, to the financial industry and uh, for economic stimulus, and I thought, $8.5 billion, that's a bargain. Uh, times have changed, but I will say this, uh, on a cost-benefit basis, based on the evaluation literature that we'll have, this costs $8.5 billion, but it de uh, delivers uh, $10 billion in benefits, both in uh, reduced offending uh, and reduced, uh, reduced correctional costs. So the system uh, uh, would pay for itself. How big is the system now? Nationally, we spend about uh, $60 billion, 60 or $70 billion uh, on, uh, on corrections. Uh, and so we would be talking about 10% uh, of the entire correctional budget uh, of, the, uh, of the whole country. So this is one blueprint uh, for moving forward. I offer it uh, to this room as a provocation uh, for discussion. Uh, I'm uh, very much looking forward to our uh, question and answer period. I'm very much looking forward to uh, our panelists. So let me close there and thank you once again for the opportunity to speak this evening. So at this point, uh, we're going to move to the question and answer forum. And I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and um, be brief. Simply say their name, uh, their position at whatever organization they're at. And then I'm going to ask them to briefly describe why they have become involved in these issues, why these issues matter to them. Um, hopefully, we can keep it around a minute. <laughs> Um, so I really urge you to use the programs to learn more about our panelists. Um, and then after that, we're going to move to the question and answer. And you can see there's a microphone here and a microphone on the other side. And once we get to that section, if um, you can line up and ask questions, and I'll describe that a little bit later. So now we're going to move um, to our panelists. We'll start from this side. <laughs> I'm Eileen Farley. I'm the director at Northwest Defenders Association, one of four King County public defender agencies. And my interest, having been doing criminal defense work for 30 years, is simply because uh, the people who are discussed here tonight are our clients. The particular issues that Professor Western highlighted um, were highlighted again for me by a May 2011 Wall Street Journal article which identified uh, private prison stocks as a good buy and a strong growth uh, industry for the future. Uh, between 2000 and 2010, the Corrections uh, Corporation of America generated $1.5 billion in free cash after, after paying its shareholders dividends, making capital purchases, and uh, providing maintenance on its facilities. That amount of money is going to be fought for by these corporations uh, in the face of any effort to implement Professor Western's wonderful program. But I think it is a discussion that we have to have and that we have to fight for. Thank you so much for coming out on this evening to look at graphs, which I found fascinating, though I was initially terrified that there was going to be a lot more numbers. My name is Kimberly Gordon, and I am a criminal defense attorney. I was a public defender for a long time before going into private practice. And I, I want to echo what Eileen said about these are our clients, but these are also what I have come to know is these are our family members, these are our community members, these are people that go, children that go to our sons and daughters' schools, this, these are their parents. This is the community, the neighborhoods that we grow up in, and it's affecting us all. I'm also here tonight because I want to talk about one small thing that you can go do right now to begin to work on the plan that he has presented to us. And there's information sheets that I've handed out about Senate Bill 5019, House Bill 1235. 
And when you look at the charts, the graphs that he's presented, I mean, it, I, what this is targeting is people that don't even make it onto those charts because these are the people that were arrested but weren't even convicted. And in Washington, that's 50% of misdemeanors and 25% of felonies. All those cases, they're not convicted. And they're still denied housing, employment, all of the effects that you're seeing here, and this is a way to mitigate those damages. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards, and thank you. Hello, I'm Dolphy Jordan. I am the volunteer coordinator for the post-prison education program. And there are a lot of issues I could talk about, but in the context of the topic tonight of inequality, I have to make a personal comparison. In 1989, I was arrested and convicted for murder. In 1989, Troy Davis was also arrested and convicted for murder. Today, I'm reuniting with my family, pursuing a college education, and working for an organization that allows me to give back to our communities. We were both teenagers. I was white, he was black. Now I have to wonder, sitting here today, if I'd be here if I was black. There needs to be alternatives to mass incarceration. I'm Jenna Melman. I'm the Director of Applicant and Student Affairs with the Post-Prison Education Program. And I wanted to highlight um, the education piece of the reentry plan. Um, education has been proven a successful tool to help prisoners reenter society. And um, a meta-analysis published in 2004 shows that just with just two years of a college education, you can reduce the likelihood that men and women will return to prison from 60% to 10%. And that in all studies looking at education and recidivism, there shows at least some reduction in the rate of people going back. Um, at, at the post-prison education program, we help people get into college, or VOTEC, and pursue a degree or certificate. And our rate of recidivism is less than 2%. So I think that as a community, we need to find ways to provide opportunities that people may have never had before to find an education, and be successful. Hi, I'm Cheryl Strange. I'm the Vice President of uh, Behavioral Health for Pioneer Human Services, an organization uh, here based out of Seattle, but uh, statewide uh, with regard to housing, uh, treatment for mental health and chemical dependency issues, and jobs for individuals involved in um, the criminal justice system. Um, I'm here, I think it's important to shed some light on the results of uh, mass incarceration with regard to health status and health care expenditures of incarcerated and post-incarcerated individuals. Uh, this is certainly true in the context of those with serious and persistent mental illness as well as those convicted of drug-related crimes, but it is certainly not limited to treatment for this or lack of treatment. Um, we need to consider chronic lack of access to health care and the effects of this on an individual's overall health status. A person um, age 55 who has been incarcerated has a health profile of an individual who, of non-incarcerated individual, a health profile of an 80-year-old. Um, so we're talking about chronic disease, uh, heart disease, renal disease, diabetes, hypertension, uh, and very serious dental issues. So everything you heard uh, the, um, Professor Western uh, present with regard to in, uh, invisibility, intergenerational issues, inequality, uh, can be equally applied to the injustice of the lack of health care access uh, for folks that have been incarcerated. So we know that access to health care is cheaper and better in the long run than lack of access to health care. And I, too, uh, am grateful that we're here and am available after the panel to answer any questions or dialogue about that. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is David Lujano, and I'm also a volunteer for our post-prison education program, uh, and also was convicted for a murder case back in 97, and I did almost 15 years in prison. Uh, I was born in L.A., and uh, they took me back to Mexico when I was a kid, and the environment that I was growing up at, it wasn't too good. I ended up getting cut up in gangs and, you know, all that. You know, the statistics shows the dropout school that never went to school. Uh, I did my time, and through my time, it wasn't so many programs in the DOC department to better yourself. And I guess I'm here today to be an example that, you know, it is possible, maybe not for the ones out here, but for the ones that are still in there that, you know, if you give yourself a chance and people like a uh, post-prison education program and other people that can give you a chance to better yourself, uh, it is possible. You know, I agree with the statistics. I mean, uh, I was there with people. I like, at, at first it was just a handful of us as far as being Mexicans. And within like eight, nine years, I mean, it went from hundreds to, to the thousands and, and it's just crazy to see that. And uh, I'm just here tonight to be an example and then there is a possibility to change. And I'm just thankful to be here. Hi, my name is uh, Maggie Wilkins, and I'm state field coordinator for the League of Education Voters. And we are a statewide advocacy organization that works on public school policy. Um, and I would like to talk about the uh, school discipline policies here in our state um, that mirror and reflect the trend of mass incarceration. Um, here in Seattle, in particular, uh, we see that. In the high school area, 5%, excuse me, um, African American students are five times as likely as white students to be suspended. And it's even more alarming in elementary school, you're 11 times, if you're, if you're a black student, you're 11 times more likely to be suspended than a white student. Um, and, I, and I only wish that we had as good a data as we just saw on the screen, but unfortunately, um, Washington as a state doesn't collect this data holistically. We just know it to be true based on national trends. and so. Our organization is leading a campaign uh, to ask our state to collect this data more thoroughly and to reconsider zero tolerance policies. Hi, my name is Alexis Harris. I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Washington. Um, and the reason why I'm here is just to sort of highlight the importance of education, both, both formal education at, at the high school level, college level, graduate level, it's sort of being the equalizer and giving people opportunities as Professor Western has talked about. But also the importance of education like panels, uh, like this one tonight, is hearing these statistics, although we've become overwhelmed, but, but sort of listening to that and remembering that this is being done in our name and that we have a voice as concerned citizens, as now educated citizens, to do something about it, because if we don't, then again, we're complicit in this process. Good evening, uh, my name is Johannes Wielden. I'm doing a postdoc at Washington State University, um, and I also teach uh, at the Coyote Ridge Correctional Center as part of Associate of Arts program there. Um, I guess I just want to say, you know, we live in a disposable society. We throw away food, we throw away cheap electronic goods, and we throw away people. We trap them in a mistake, and we punish them day after day, year after year, based on a notion that punishment works. Um, what I see in the classroom is, is the potential for education to help the guys that I have gotten a chance to meet and work with, uh, for them to build a self, to, to understand their history, understand themselves, and begin to plan for the future. So thanks for the opportunity. I'm Doug Merlino. I'm a journalist. Um, my, uh, through my work, I've written on race and class in Seattle, and it's brought me um, into the lives of some people who are in this system of coming in and out of prison, um, getting to know their families, uh, getting to know them really well. And I mean, I think Professor Western, you know, his, his book is brilliant. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's deep and really when you get into it, it's very, it can be very depressing and, and overwhelming. Um, you know, there is a, uh, normalization of prison and, and you know, uh, there's economic issues and all types of stuff going on. And I think uh, 
getting to know those people uh, brought me, I want to put in a, a pitch for R.A. Cohen and the Post-Prison Education Project because you start looking for things that can be done concretely. Um, and I know, I'm sure R.A. would say that this is just around the edges, but you see that um, getting people helping them with education, giving them support, you see lives change and you see that, you know, what a in incredible waste it is to lock up, you know, 2.3 million people. Uh, and then you see the human cost to families, to children, to communities, to the city. And um, I mean, I just think, you know, when you think about going from a half million people in prison in 1980 to about 2.3 million today, you know, I think we always look back you know, we like to look back at things in the past, in the six, you know, 50s and 60s, and think, oh, how, how could Jim Crow happen, or how could this happen? And I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's fine to do that, but I also think, you know, right now, um, people 50 or 60 years from now uh, will look back at us and think, what were they doing, what were they thinking? So um, I think that this is something that, that, that we should all, you know, look at and be aware of and, you know, look at programs that, that are actually working and, and helping people. My name is Lisa Dugard. I am with the Defender Association Racial Disparity Project. Um, what I want to say tonight is, while it is completely right that we need a humane exit plan for people who are currently trapped in the system, we will still be trapped on a giant hamster wheel if we don't stop putting people into that system. I want to um, comment about... <laughs> or just offer a little bit of insight about um, the thought process that very often leads to many of those admissions into the system. Um, this is an excerpt from a police report from uh, Federal Way um, in July of this year. I'm just going to read you a bit of it. Um, Officer W was conducting a foot patrol at the Kent Transit Center, a known area where gang members have congregated in the past. Officer W observed an unknown black male, BH, walking through the Transit Center wearing a heavy black coat and a gray knit cap. Officer W knows from his training and experience that subjects that are illegally carrying a firearm like to wear heavy coats and loose clothing to conceal the firearm. Officer W observed the large left front pocket of BH's coat to be sagging as if a heavy object was inside the pocket. Officer W observed the outline of an object that was approximately six inches long and laying in the bottom of the pocket parallel to the ground. Okay, at this point, you may have questions about what's going on in this um, investigation, but that's not really why I'm sharing it with you. This is why. BH walked to a group of approximately five other males who jaywalked across the street. BH was the only person in the group not to jaywalk. BH walked approximately 75 yards to a crosswalk, crossed the street, and rejoined the group that had illegally crossed the street. Officer W knows from his training and experience, wait for it, that subjects con concealing weapons or contraband will avoid committing infractions in front of police to avoid contact with the police and possible discovery of what they are concealing. So BH got busted that night for crossing a street legally, and, I, and this is to make you angry. Uh, my name is Larry Gosselin, and currently I serve as the chair of the King County uh, Council here in uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, County, and I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Ari Khan uh, and his program for uh, sponsoring this very enlightening and educational uh, and hopefully inspirational uh, event uh, this evening and inviting uh, uh, Bruce Western uh, to speak to us. Uh, I want to just reinforce what Lisa Dugard has said about what's happening here locally because I think that makes everything our speaker said relevant. King County is the government that operates the criminal justice center here in our community. Uh, Bruce mentioned that about uh, 800,000 uh, uh, men and women uh, in this country are in uh, county jails on a daily population. Here in King County, we have 2,052 men and women who have been in jail every day uh, this year. Of that number, 
in a county that's 5.4% black, uh, on each of those days this year, at least 40% of those in the King County Jail have been African Americans. Of those who go to state prison uh, for drugs, it's over 60%, but nearly half of everybody that goes to prison from this county uh, are low-income African Americans, uh, all poor, and the second fastest growing population of folks who are going to uh, state prison in King County are African American women now, and it's a, ch it's a great challenge. Uh, I'd just like to conclude uh, by having all of you think about what it is we can do in our local community uh, to change this situation, because through mass organizing, we can eliminate mass incarceration, but that's the only way uh, it's going to be done because most politicians are not going to voluntarily uh, say that I want to reduce the criminal budgets and use it to help enhance the living condition of poor and, and oppressed people. Uh, one final example, uh, Bruce mentioned number three on his national prison reentry plan that uh, we should have no more uh, re-imprisonment of technical parole violators um, in this country. That's a very relevant point because most of them, uh, right now we have a state contract uh, with the uh, Washington State Department of Corrections where we keep 438 men and women in the King County Jail every day uh, for state violations and most of them for very minor not having uh, uh, enough money uh, to come from federal way to downtown Seattle to see their probation officer. The state picks them up and put them in the King County Jail. If we had mass organizing to deal with mass incarceration, we could radically reduce that figure in Washington State as it relates to our county in less than a year. We just have to have the will to do it, y'all. Let's do something about what's happening. Thank you. La mano dura no funciona. Being tough on crime is not enough. We must be smart on crime. My name is Leno Rosavila. I'm the executive director of a new organization called Community Health and Safety Committee, and we have a table downstairs and ask you to get involved with us as we organize the voice of Latinos to speak out about the injustices within the so-called judicial system. I have to tell you that every time that we talk about incarcerating people, it is done on fear. A fear of uh, terrorists, a fear of blacks, a fear of Latinos, a fear of immigrants. And you know, we have this great amount program that we've spent billions of dollars with called the War on Drugs. And it's really been the war on people of color and people who are poor. And we are incarcerating people every day in the state of Washington for simply smoking a joint. And, and that's not a reason to incarcerate people. And we have a chance. Oh, man, that was good. Um, uh, we have a chance to change that this year because there's a petition by New Approach to legalize marijuana. And it's something that should have happened a long time ago. We have petitions in the back there. I got to tell you that, um, you know, the... Our friend was talking about, you know, about gang members being innocently charged. And we have a friend of ours, uh, James Lopez, who are, we're working on the case of, who's innocently charged to be involved in the Kent gang shooting. And he was not part of it, and we're going to get him free, and we're going to prove him innocent. But it's going to cost us a lot of money and community effort. And you can help Community Health Services Committee do that. The other thing i got to tell you is that we should not listen to our politicians and the fear that they place on us. And one of the biggest fears that they've used to incarcerate people of color, and in particular immigrants, is 9-11 and the creation of Homeland Security. You know, now... And, and what you got to see, and we all respond like sheeps to it, because we're worried about terrorists coming from Mexico. Nobody terrorists came from Mexico. Second, but we're incarcerating more people in the federal prison who are immigrants than any other group right now. 
The other thing is they have us taking our shoes off. Now that the underwear bomber has pleaded guilty, <laughs> expect to take your underwear off. <laughs> you know, the other day it makes me mad because it's all based on fear and the prisons like a TSA is all a profit-based industry. So the other day when they were doing the pat down and I have a metal in my knees and they were doing the invasive stuff, the guy says, I'm gonna pat you down in the groin area with the back of my hands. And I said, do you mind if I hold on to you if I get excited? <laughs> That's how stupid this stuff is. We must put a stop to stupidity on drugs, stupidity on incarceration and place our efforts and issues and strength and our future in the humanity of each of us. All right, so thank you again, everybody, for being here and for um, sharing with us. So now we're getting to um, the public question and answer period. Um, so there's a microphone here, a microphone over there. If you have questions, please form a line here. Um, and we're gonna lay some, some ground rules. So first of all, it has to be a question. <laughs> um, just, and this is just out of respect for everybody else in the audience. We, we're trying to really keep it short, so please ask one question. Um, and this is also out of respect for the panelists and it's out of respect for uh, Seattle Town Hall that have so graciously ac accepted to host our event here. So please ask one question, keep it brief, and you can direct this question to a specific person on the panel or you can just throw it out and they can pick it up. Um, any questions about the rules? <laughs> okay, great. So. The, the lineup. They can't see it. They can't see it. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't understand your. Okay. So, all right. So you all got the idea. We're gonna do one. Um, well, my right, your left, and then one from this side. Okay. So, go ahead. Thank you. This is a follow-up for. Um, Bruce Western and also for the other panelists, if you could elaborate please on the penal system. You said it grew out of a number of problems. Could we go back to the 70s and talk about those problems and how, you know, what precipitated this huge expansion? Sure. Uh so uh, very quickly, and I didn't talk uh, very much at all about the growth of the penal system. Very quickly, uh, I, I think uh, the causes of the, uh, the, uh, the increase uh, in imprisonment rates uh, are really two. Uh, one's political and one's economic. Uh, on the economic side, uh, what we saw in American cities uh, through uh, the 1960s and 1970s was uh, massive uh, deindustrialization, massive job loss uh, in urban manufacturing uh, that uh, basically pulled the rug out uh, from uh, underneath uh, urban workers uh, who had uh, very low levels of schooling. Uh, this caused uh, uh, really substantial problems of uh, uh, high rates of unemployment, uh, uh, chronic joblessness, and uh, a, a whole variety of social disorders uh, that, uh, that flowed from that. Uh, uh, young guys hanging out idle uh, uh, without a great deal uh, uh, of structure in their lives as a consequence of the economic changes in American cities. That was on the economic side. On the political side, uh, what were the 60s? The 60s uh, were uh, a, a moment of uh, great political ferment. Uh, uh, the uh, a, a, a period of uh, tremendous activism uh, around uh, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, uh, uh, and also uh, the women's movement. Um, in a reaction uh, uh, to this uh, intense period uh, of political uh, political activism. Uh, uh, political leaders, ultimately from both parties, but uh, initially uh, chiefly from, uh, from the Republican Party, uh, 
uh, began to move to the right uh, on uh, criminal justice issues and, and the problem of uh, order, uh, law and order, uh, and being tough on crime came to occupy national politics uh, uh, in a new way. And the, and, uh, uh, the politics uh, of criminal justice became more punitive as part of the backlash, I think, uh, to the political activism of the 60s. And these two forces ran headlong into each other. Uh, the, the employment uh, crisis in American cities uh, ran headlong into an increasingly punitive politics uh, of criminal justice. And it was the combination of these two conditions, I think, uh, that uh, ultimately produced these extraordinary incarceration rates. If I could just briefly add, you know, we went from the war on poverty to the war on crime to the war on drugs, and we're now living through an era of the war on science. Um, and the question is, can we communicate what we know works in a way that can overcome the punitive ideology under which we're living? That's the question. I don't know the answer yet. Hi, uh, my question is directed to um, Dr. Western. Um, you said in your um, kind of remedy, um, getting, using the um, kind of community kind of policing with reentry, um, with a community that's ill, um, um, it seems to me that you're gonna need financing and support to build the community first to embrace people who are coming to re-enter into that community as well. So um, I would like to get your ideas on that. And plus, um, just on a, on a side note, um, 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 part of the dropout rate is that there are some remedial skills that they need to be educated as well to get them to the point that they're educated going through college and what have you. Um, and how is that gonna be helped out with a school system that has really failed them? I mean, this is a, a, a tremendously hard question uh, you're raising, I think, and uh, um, often uh, in work on uh, prison programming and uh, uh, post-prison programming, um, the, whole, uh, the whole model uh, is motivated to uh, correct deficiencies uh, within the client. Uh, but of course, uh, the client uh, who's uh, getting the substance abuse treatment or the education or uh, the job training uh, is returning uh, to a, a community of tremendous social and economic adversity. And so how are they going to succeed uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this context, and I think that's uh, a, a major reason why uh, uh, it, it's very difficult to find uh, successful programs because people are returning to uh, such conditions uh, of adversity. And so I think the, the community itself needs to be part uh, of, of any plan uh, to, uh, uh, to retrench mass incarceration. The ultimate objective, uh, the way I think about it, uh, is the, uh, uh, a kind of strategy for public safety in which communities have to be enlisted, but it's, it's public safety of a very thick kind in which people have uh, order and regularity in their lives, and that means a whole variety of mainstream social institutions, families, schools, uh, uh, the labour market, have to provide sources uh, of social stability. Uh, the, you know, the way I was thinking about this in the context of my re-entry plan is that uh, uh, support uh, would be uh, provided to uh, uh, local community actors so they could be enlisted in the process uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, of social reintegration. And so they would uh, also be, I think, uh, a constituency for this sort of thick public safety. Yeah, I like um, people, if they could talk about um, getting people out in the streets like what's happening across the United States right now with the urgency of what's going on and not relying on the same things that have been going on for a long time. 
Um, and I've talked to two people on this pa panel, and, and probably a lot of you know, but the public doesn't know about the horrible conditions of prisoners like in California, where they just had two hunger strikes just to get basic humane conditions. And in this country, most middle class people do not understand the horrors of prison. They don't understand police brutality. And so I think the thing is, there's a, this is a tremendous thing that you're going to be on Channel 21. But in light of we have a black president and many people let Troy Davis die on death row, people are not, you know, they're sick and tired of relying on the systemic ways that they're supposed to deal with this. Can someone address the power of what it, I think is very important? We're having a protest in Westlake about police brutality and criminalization on the 22nd. Shameless plug here that I would like to know if people can address actually diverting people to where it's going to make a difference, standing up against this stuff. Thank you. When uh, Eileen and I were actually talking about this book yesterday and what one of the things that we would want people to go out and do. And you are learning such valuable information tonight, information that doesn't get into the hands of our judges, our legislators, people that can make a difference. Um, you can make a difference by educating them. Go to your city council meetings, go to your neighborhood meetings, tell people to read this book. But also, when you look at any stories in the news about crime in our communities, and you look at the responses, the comments, the comments are punitive. The comments don't recognize that these are us, not them, that are being accused of crimes. And so you can respond to that to get the dialogue going in all of these different forums. I can uh, just add one thing. I, I think it is, um, there, there are mass discussions going on about um, high levels of unemployment. I think Professor Western's point that that is not the real unemployment rate needs to be interjected into the conversation about the national economic crisis at every opportunity because if it isn't, any solution that unfolds will um, provide you know, job opportunities for people who have, are used to having job opportunities but will leave unaddressed structural unemployment for the chronically unemployed in those um, whose criminal history is that barrier. Um, I also think it is very important that people start um, talking openly and without a sense of stigma about their criminal history since it is normalized, right? I mean, it's incredibly common to have criminal history. People need to start saying that that's part of my experience, that's why I'm not able to get a job, so that it stops being this hidden phenomenon and starts being um, in the center of the public discourse about the unemployment crisis. I just have a really quick question, um, and I address it to anybody who's interested in answering it. But um, do you think that we're ever going to successfully address this problem and actually decrease the prison industrial complex without um, addressing the, the incentive, the broader social incentive, to increase the prison industrial complex? And that is that the prison industrial complex is a private industry now. And corporations are making billions of dollars off the private industry of the prison co industrial complex. It's also one of the biggest sources of cheap labor in this country. And private corporations like IBM, AT&T, Hewlett Packard are going into prisons and they're pay paying prisoners 20 cents an hour to do work that a, a normal average citizen out of prison could do for $14 or $20 an hour. And those prisoners are becoming an incredibly huge source of cheap labor. So do you think, and, and because the prisoners are getting paid 20 cents an hour, they're actually getting charged money for the services they use in prison. So when a prisoner has a candy bar, they're charged for it. And when prisoners come out of prison, they actually owe the prison industrial complex. I'll, I'll finish yeah, my sorry. sentence. So could you tell me, can we, can we address this? problem without addressing the fact that the prison industrial complex is a private industry. Can I actually uh, want to sort oh. of piggyback on that just really quickly and one thing that I do research on that I, I didn't talk about and which a lot of people don't know about are monetary sanctions. 
And I study them at the felony level, so anyone with a felony conviction knows what LFO stands for in Washington State, and that's a legal financial obligation. So on top of having this privatized industry, it's very a public industry as well, in that people are being charged for every single point of contact in the criminal justice system. So in Washington State, people are charged for their public defender. If they can't afford one, one will be appointed to them, but they'll be charged $450 a pop per felony conviction, literally. Minimum, it's $600, you're charged 600 in Washington State for $500 victim crime penalty fee and a DNA fee of $100. There's a number of fees that range from, in King County, the minimum, the average is 600 and Clark, it's around 2200 and that's per felony conviction. And then in Washington State, at the point of sentencing, you're charged 12% interest, and that accrues annually, plus an additional $100 collection fee. So on top, on top of private industries making money, the state is now turning to the defendants, the people convicted of felonies, to pay for this whole process, including their incarceration um, themselves. So this is a, even a bigger issue if you think in terms of the collateral consequences that people talk about and the, the penalties for wages. There's a large amount of legal debt that keeps people trapped to the criminal justice system, and they're incarcerated for non-payment. Even if they're, I've seen people who are homeless who are incarcerated because they can't make payments um, in several counties in Washington State. So that's an addition. It's not answering any questions, but it's something else I want to put on your radar that's happening with the uh, criminalization. Well, I'm just briefly, anybody who knows me knows I'm not a, a Pollyanna, but I think that Professor Western did start with um, perhaps the one good thing the recession has brought us, which is the corrections industry and which is funded by tax dollars, is now just about the fourth largest expense nationally and in most states. And people are prepared to have a conversation about that cost. I toured the uh, uh, Portland Community Court a few years ago with somebody from the Downtown Seattle Association, which is not your, I, I don't know if any of them are here today, but it is not your liberal group. And their representative said, we recognize that we cannot jail our way out of these problems. That, that is a huge shift, it is an opening, it is a start to a conversation, but we have to have that conversation and we have to bring all this information forward. Today, the uh, City of Seattle opened the LEAD program, which is a law enforcement alternative diversion. It is an alternative for some offenders to jail before offenses happen. Ms. Dugard and Councilmember Gossett have been very instrumental in that. There are small steps, but they are steps, and you just have to keep rolling along, because otherwise, what's your option? All right. Sure. Applause. <laughs> All right, so again, please just keep it to a question, please, just for time. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Kaim Elia. I have a college degree and a criminal history. Um, my question had to do with something that Professor Western mentioned about invisibility, and it's kind of a critical one. My question is basically, to whom is this problem invisible? Because we've been talking about this for 40 years, uh, starting with Angela Davis and then Michael Davis suggesting that we abolish the, the prison system entirely, um, and you know, groups like Earth First and other parts of the anarchist movement. And so I would, I would like to get more opinions than, than just Professor Western, but, but also I, I hope that we can address that this is not something that oh my God, it's in the May issue, like it just came up. This has been going on for some time and probably longer than the skyrocketing we talked about in the 1980s. So if you could speak to that. Anyone? <laughs> Do you want me to respond or not? I, I wasn't yeah, <laughs> if nobody else will respond, please, somebody respond. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a, a, a centuries-long uh, discussion about uh, how we punish and uh, uh, what does that say about us, the way in which we punish. Um, I think, and, and, uh, and uh, you're right, that there has been... Uh, uh, a very strong uh, uh, and influential uh, activist uh, uh, community and uh, history of uh, uh, writing in the United States. It's, uh, 
uh, that really uh, is, is also part of, this, uh, part of this story. I think what's new about the, uh, the current period is uh, that uh, criminal justice agencies are saturating the uh, social life of poor communities like never before. That's new. And that's really, uh, uh, that's really emerged to this extent, this extraordinary rate of penal confinement. It, it, this, is, uh, this is really just uh, 10 years old. And I think that provides new challenges uh, to our politics. This is a, a, an utterly radioactive issue uh, in, uh, in mainstream uh, electoral politics. Because partly we got here because of the, uh, what elected officials perceived to be uh, the, the benefits of being tough on crime. There was no percentage in being anything but tough on crime uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. And those more critical voices, I think, have been completely marginalised uh, from, uh, uh, from the mainstream discussion. Because the states are broke, I think a door is opening on the kind of political conversation uh, that we can have now. And, uh, and it, I, it's a very open question as to what this conversation uh, is going to look like, but there's an opportunity for us now, and uh, I think we should take it, and we should call on those older critical traditions. Uh, and uh, and I, I certainly see my work as trying to contribute uh, in that respect. I'd, I'd like to say a couple of things. One is that if we really want to address the judicial system, I think we first have to get a strong focus on race because race plays such a big issue. And I want to also honor my brother Dolphy for bringing up um, Troy Davis because it's clear Troy would be alive if he was white. And you know in the South and the, where we fought and where we had lynchings before they were legalized and then once uh, we eliminated lynchings as a law. They found another way to lynch blacks and Latinos and poor whites legally. So you know that the race of the victim on the death penalty, which is the end run of all of our uh, penal system, is based on the race of the victim. So if you kill a white person in America and you happen to be black, you have a much greater chance of receiving the death penalty. And I think we really have to deal with the racism in America and the economics of America because poor white people shouldn't go to jail. You can see that rich white people accused of the same thing as a poor white person or a black or Latino are not going to get that sentence. And I've worked on the death penalty long enough and searched hard and long and I've yet to see a wealthy person receive the death penalty. Not that I want it for anybody, but I just want you to know that we're dealing with a very strong system of racism and unless we begin to address that, we're not going to deal with our correctional system appropriately. I'll just quickly respond. I, I don't see uh, Secretary Warner from the Department of Corrections was here a little earlier. He may have moved around in the room. but. You know, I want to uh, just put a, a plug in for the state of Washington and the efforts that goes into our state. Um, uh, we are 48th in the nation for incarceration rates, and that is because of uh, folks uh, in this room, folks who are showing up. I think Washington, I won't say a lot, it, it speaks for itself, 48th in the nation for incarceration rates, which means it's almost to the bottom. So uh, we need to keep doing what we're doing. And, and we need to uh, uh, recognize that uh, transparency in prisons and uh, volunteering in prisons and volunteering and working in the field, getting educated, studying is a very critical part. And I just want to remind folks in uh, the great state of Washington and Seattle that, yeah, I think we have something to be proud of. Thank you. Please. Uh, hello, thanks for all being here. I'll uh, try and make this quick. Uh, what is your opinion on the CSA, the War on Drugs, and in particular, the Patriot Act, in relation to the dramatic increase to prison population 
and private penal profits as of this year. And uh, if race is really a factor in all of this, and uh, ultimately, uh, where does the state of Washington stand? Well, I, um, just on one aspect of, that's kind of a really big question. Uh, the uh, Washington Defender Association, which is a statewide group of defender associ uh, associations and uh, contractors, uh, sponsors an immigration project uh, to help us when we have clients with immigration consequences. And what we have seen through that project is the merger in not just Washington, but across the country, uh, of the Federal Department of Homeland Security into local jail systems in a way that was never true before. Uh, King County has paid a significant amount of money to send its uh, uh, arrest data to uh, central uh, location in DC where the Department of Homeland Security mines it for uh, potential immigration people who might not be in the country with, with papers. I mean, that's, it's a, it's a huge shift to think that every person who goes into a jail has their name and identifying information fed into a national database in DC. So in one sense, um, what we can be proud of is, is that in Washington there has been move away from this secure communities program. Uh, and that even the latest proponent of it, the mayor in Marysville, uh, his city council said they weren't that keen to do it. Uh, and I think, again, that's part of a discussion that people can bring to uh, this issue, which is that these federal programs have huge costs, huge consequences, and what exactly are we doing? What are we preventing? What, what exactly is this worth? And to even just raise that question, I think with your local elected officials who make the decisions on this, with your local elected sheriff, is a huge step to not let this just be a steamroller. So I, that's only a small part of your question, but it, that is something that you can do on a regular basis, and I encourage you to do it. All right, so please go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Yasmin, and first off, I'd like to say thank you to Maggie Wilkins for saying that about the people who are here and people who are doing stuff. So um, I'd like to address that. My question is for David. Uh, I have a very good friend who uh, went uh, through a similar experience that you went, and I was reading your experience here. Um, I would like to know how, what you did, it says over here, um, while incarcerated, he was asked by prison administration to control and defuse gang ten tensions inside prisons and create a safer environment for prisoners. So I, wa I would like you to know how you did that in prison, so. I guess it was, uh, it's kind of like a long story, but just to make it sure, at uh... in, in specific reference to the Hispanic population being seen as like, or yeah, the, the immigrant stigma that the Hispanic population has, so. You know, like I mentioned uh, earlier, earlier uh, when I first went in, it was 97, and uh, when I went to Walla Walla, it was 98, and it was only a handful of us being Latino or Mexican, and by probably 2001, 2002, we went from 100s to the thousands, Obviously, you know, the environment in prison is not going to be too pleasant, so there's always going to be problems and everything. Well, because I guess I was, by 2005 or 2006, I already done like nine years, so I became to be like one of the oldest in the system. And for the system itself, I thought they thought that somehow we have some pool or some Jews or however you want to call it with other people in the population. Uh, this time I was, I found myself in McNeil Island and I was actually going to school taking uh, graphic design and I had a job up in industries and uh, pretty much I was doing all right. But then there was, I guess, a, a problem or an issue up in Monroe where they wanted to go from a closed custody facility to a medium. But like I said, with so many numbers and most of them being kids that never 
nobody ever took the time to talk to them, uh, talk to them about anything in prison. They just were going crazy, you know, fighting each other. So they went around the system asking people to see if they wanted, they voluntarily wanted to go to, that pr uh, to the prison. Like I said, long story short, we end up going. And at first, I'm not even gonna lie to you, when they approached me with this, I was like, no, you know, I'm working, I'm going to school, and I got a good, good celly, a cellmate. You know, give me a good reason for me to go to Monroe, and the only thing they could come up with was that, that I can get a single men's cell for myself, you know. And I said, no, you know, that, that, that's not gonna happen. But anyways, uh, due to the fact that it was a big problem with the NAS as far as being Latinos, and we were aware of it, because even if I was gonna get transferred somewhere else, I wasn't on jeopardy to get assaulted or to get stab or whatever you want to call it and uh, so we talk within within each other's and we decided to go and kind of help with the problem and we did and the way we did it was to uh, I guess the system or the the people in Monroe was willing to work with us to make it happen and I think that was the key to open up a communication with us and them not to look at us as just or you guys deserve to be here and we're going to punish you 100% for it, but open up a communication to where like, you can understand us, why we act the way we act sometimes. And it's not so much about just being a knucklehead. A lot of the times it has to be with issues that you deal with your own self or families, you know, that no one knows about. And the only way you can just get rid of it is by acting up. So then again, little story short, the officials, uh, the people at Monroe, Help, uh, helped us to, to talk to our own people, and eventually, I guess, it helped us and them to go from a close custody facility to a media facility. And, uh, and I can actually say it was a blessing for me to go at the end of the day, because I had the chance to meet so many good people in that place, and, you know, that changed my life to the point where that's where I'm here now. I mean, the people that knows me from before, can tell you that for me to be here today is a blessing, you know, and I thank with all my heart to those people, and one of them is Mr. Frakes, that, that he gave me the chance to get connected with post-prison education program, and thanks to them, then I'm going to college right now, shooting for a degree on uh, graphic designs, and trying to start a new life. So in case you haven't noticed, <laughs> we're running really over time, um, but uh, we, um, so we're going to have to wrap it up really quickly here, but um, we have, uh, all of us have business cards and some of the panels have agreed to stick around afterwards so you can talk to them. Um, and I'm just going to uh, let Ari take it from here really quickly. Oh. First of all, Shima's going to get her business cards out and come down. And we're 35 minutes past 9 o'clock when we're supposed to close. And we're really grateful that Town Hall hasn't uh, booted us out yet. But we want to get everybody who has questions, get Shima's business card. Email your question to her. If you have a, a particular panelist that you'd like to address the question, Shima will get the question to the panelists and you will get their answer. Uh, so we, we just have to do that. Um, Cheryl mentioned uh, that Bernie Warner was here a while ago and I don't know, he may still be here, but uh, Olympia is 65 miles away and the Secretary of the Department of Corrections is an incredibly busy person uh, and we really appreciated the fact that he came up to be with us tonight. Uh, Johannes Wielden came all the way from some town called Othello, which I think is just a little bit east of South Carolina, to be with, to be with us, uh, and and obviously Professor Western from from uh, from all the way from Boston. So uh, we've got a, we've had a, an incredible panel, and and I'm really really indebted. These are incredibly wonderful people, and I'm very appreciative that you're here. Uh, also, uh, I wanted to say we, you know, we can't undo the hard lives that our students have lived, uh, but we can provide them with a, with the opportunity to pursue post-secondary education, 
and to build lives worth living for themselves, their families, and their communities. We've got more than 700 applications in our office right now, real number, more than 700 people really crying out for help. More than 8,000 men and women come out of Washington's prisons every month, more than 700 a month, 8,000 a year, excuse me. Um, if you've been moved by what you've heard tonight and the people you've met uh, and the hope and the opportunity that the post-prison education program represents, then we ask you to make what we'd like to call a stretch gift. Um, and, and define that as a, a, an amount that's meaningful to you uh, that will push your limits a little bit. Uh, and for some, that might be $5. For some, that might be 500 Maybe somebody can write a check for $1,000. But please consider what you can do uh, tonight and stop by the donation boxes, and, and whether it's a check or a cash or, a, or fill out a remit envelope and, and make a pledge. Uh, help us get more people coming out of prison, into school, uh, and into futures where they don't return to prison. Our recidivism rate, by the way, is less than 2%. Uh, and not to slam or embarrass the Department of Corrections, theirs is 43% of people return to prison within five years with one or more new felony convictions. Uh, in our six-year history, we've had two people recidivate, 1.8% recidivism rate. So, it's, it's, a, it's a great investment, and we hope that you'll, that you'll uh, really look into your hearts and, 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 uh, and write a check or make a pledge. Um, that beyond that, I just really want to thank you for coming. It's, it was amazing tonight to look out here. And it was amazing to see this amazing panel. Thank you, every one of you. So on behalf of the, <coughs> excuse me, on behalf of the League of Education Voters, Real Change Homeless Empowerment Project, <coughs> excuse me, project in the Post-Prison Education Program, we're deeply grateful for you having come. Thank you.